I'm here for alchemy and science, choosing metrics that work. Like Chris and everyone else here at Indeed, I help people get jobs. The way we help get jo people get jobs is starting with a search. People give us keywords, they give us a location, and then we show them jobs that are relevant to what they have searched for. If they like what they see, they tap in and they get more details about the job. They get an extended job description, additional information about the job, the qualifications, responsibilities, and so forth. If they see something they like here with the higher level of information, they continue to apply to the job. They submit their credentials, their experience, their resume to the employer to be considered for the job. If the employer likes what they see, they get called in for an interview. They meet face to face, they go deeper into their resume, they learn about the employer. There's a high bandwidth exchange of information. Should that go well and the employer like the candidate, they extend an offer. They offer a position, a title, salary, and so forth. And if the candidate likes what they see, they get hired. They get to work for this awesome guy who I hear is the best boss in the world. <laughs> At least that's how it works in theory. How do we know if it actually worked? We have all these great ideas. We think our product is good. We think it's solid. We think, think it helps people. But how do we know if we're actually successful? Well, this is the 21st century, and everybody knows the answer. The answer is use data. You instrument your code. You collect data points. You put it into some giant HDFS cluster. And then you have your answers. Uh, except now you have two quadrillion problems. You have all of these data points, all of these metrics, all of these events, and you have to make sense of them. A very wise man and a skilled artist said, computers are useless. They can only give you answers. And I think Pablo Picasso, I think he was pretty good. I think I can improve on this a bit. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean artistically. Uh, this is what I meant. Data is useless. It can only give you answers. What questions are you asking of this data? Because if you're asking bad questions, you're going to have bad science, and it doesn't matter how much good data you have. Let's look at a real science. Let's look at chemistry and what they do. Back in the early days, we had alchemy. Alchemy was rules of thumb, recipes, and sheer outright fantasy. Now, it could still be useful for things like Greek fire. They were able to put together a recipe where they had this highly inflammable substance that they could use to defend Byzantium for hundreds of years. And that was super useful, worked out really well. On the other hand, since they didn't understand matter and how matter operated, they would think, okay, lead into gold. Sure, why not, that's possible. And then people died all the time. They would drink mercury, they would drink arsenic, because they didn't understand how these things worked. They didn't understand chemistry, biochemistry. There was no scientific theory for making this work. Alchemy was useful at times, but this is not science. It's incomplete. With alchemy, you could only explain or describe a few things. You could only solve a few problems. It was also inflexible. You had recipes to do certain things, but if you wanted recipes to do something somewhat different, you could tweak it a little bit. If you tweaked it a lot, it would just stop working and you wouldn't understand why. And that's one of the fundamental things that made alchemy not a science. It was inexplicable. When things worked, you couldn't explain why. You just knew that they did. And when things didn't work, again, you couldn't explain why. You just knew they didn't work. I say that we are in a similar stage when it comes to metrics. Call it the alchemy of metrics. We're in this proto-science stage where we've got some things that work but we don't really understand them, and we've got some things that don't work, and we also don't understand why they don't work. We've got a lot of recipes, or as we call them in product management, frameworks. There are things like pirate metrics, arm, heart, or game. And these are frameworks that people have used to drive lots of good results, but they're not science. Frameworks are not science. They're useful tools, they're useful building blocks, but at best, they're a proto-science. So how do we go about creating a real science? You start by breaking the recipes into more elementary components, the atoms, the molecules of your chemistry. And then you connect seemingly independent phenomena, disparate 
phenomena that are actually part of the same whole. You define a holistic system to describe their interactions, how these things work together, what works, what doesn't. And then finally, you manipulate the system to achieve your goal, because we're all trying to drive an outcome here. It's beyond understanding, we actually want to make things happen. So how do we go about creating a science of metrics? Let's start with the basics, quality and quantity. A quality I'm defining here as some attribute, property, or characteristic of a phenomenon that we want to pay attention to. A unit is a count or measure of this quality. And then a metric is a number times a unit that measures this quality. There are some basic ones, like mass. The quality of mass can be measured in kilograms, perhaps two kilograms. More abstractly, we might have an interaction with a website or an application. And this might be measured in terms of clicks, and we might have six of them in a particular interaction. If you're in Indeed's business, you might have a hiring campaign where you're trying to land qualified hires, and your yield in your campaign is measured in that way. Perhaps one qualified hire is what you need. Over the years, Indeed has targeted many, many metrics. We've looked at number of searches, page views, job clicks, monthly unique visitors, job applications, daily active users, and so forth. A ton of metrics that we've targeted and optimized and tried to improve over the years. And then we've measured a whole lot of other things to pay attention to. We've looked at mobile app installs. We've looked at job alert subscriptions, saving a job, page count, number of accounts, and a whole lot more. We put all these things together, and it's just a ton of choices. There's so many different things we can measure. How do we choose which ones to pay most attention to, which ones we should prioritize? Well, before what comes why. Why do we measure? What is the ultimate purpose with gathering all this data and measuring our products? Well, a lot of people who are product managers have strong intuitions and they have confident intuitions. And so they know what's right for their product. So the data is to prove what they already believe. I know this workflow is the right workflow. I know this color scheme is the right color scheme. And I'm just going to collect data to prove what I already believe. A more advanced level is to discover what happened. You have a little bit more of an open mind. You recognize you don't have all the answers, so you put something in front of you, your users and you discover what happened to gain a deeper understanding. Another step of advancement is to understand why. Not just what did your users do, but why did they do it? Trace their paths, trace the events, and understand the why behind the actions. I claim that there's a level beyond all of this. All of those are wrong, and that the true purpose of measurement is to decide. The past is the past, and you can't change it. You put a feature out there, you put a product out there, the users interacted with it, interacted with it and it's done. You can't fix it. All you can do is look forward. You gather this data, and you look ahead to future decisions you make about your product, future decisions you make about your feature. And that's perhaps how you convert data into information. Data is inert. Data is lifeless. It's just there. For data to become information, it has to inform action. You just stick a C in there, and it makes it all make sense. You inform action with your data, and that turns it into actionable information. Otherwise, it's just trivia. It's inert. It's useless. It doesn't guide you in any meaningful way. Now, there are people here who work at many different companies, people who work at data companies, people who work at banking, telecommunications, et cetera. So everyone here has different goals. Because you all have different goals, there is no one right metric for everyone, right? There's no single answer that fits all of your use cases, all of what you're trying to do. Except I disagree. I think there is one right metric for everyone. There is one that unites all of these disparate domains that gives you the answer for the thing that you should measure that solves all of your product problems. That is lifetime value. Lifetime value I'm defining here as the total value generated over all time for your business, for your user, whatever. But it's the total value over the entire arc and the entire life cycle. So let's take Indeed's case. Do we want to make product choices that drive more jobs or more resumes? Well, it's simple. We measure lifetime value, and we pick the one that maximizes lifetime value. Easy. What about buying a car, a completely different domain? Do I want a Honda or do I want a Toyota? Well, this is a really straightforward decision. Lifetime value. It answers everything. 
completely different domain, salad or ice cream. Anybody have an idea how to make this decision? Lifetime value, right? She chose lifetime value, she chose the salad, and look at how happy she is. She made the right decision. Lifetime value works for everything. It's the one metric to solve all of your product problems. And that brings us to the end. Except uh, I have one question about lifetime value. How long does it take to measure lifetime value? Uh, maybe a lifetime, right? Thank you, Manuela Job Seeker. <laughs> After 78 years, now we can finally finish that A-B test. You gave us good service on your time on this earth. We can finally measure what we did for you in its entirety and decide back in 2018, that A-B test that we launched, was it A or was it B? That's no good, right? We need to ship next week. We cannot be making decisions on lifetime value because we can't wait that long. Some of us might not live that long. Our companies, our products may not live that long. So how do we do this better and faster? I wanna introduce you to a couple of meta metrics or metrics for metrics. Let's start with sensitivity. Here I define sensitivity as how quickly and easily you can influence a metric. Sensitivity exists on a continuum from low to high. On the high end, a metric that is sensitive is fast and easy to change. You can influence it readily and you can see the results very quickly. On the low end, it's slow and difficult to change. Whatever things that you do take a long time to be reflected and they're very hard to move. And then correlation. For all of you proper statisticians in the audience, I apologize. I'm going to bastardize your term and define correlation here as the frequency of agreement with lifetime value. And by the way, if any of you are hurt by this, Donald's gonna let me have it afterward. Correlation also exists on a continuum. On the low end, a metric that has low correlation unpredictably agrees with lifetime value. Sometimes it agrees, sometimes it doesn't. On the high end, it almost always agrees with lifetime value. A highly correlated metric will be positive when lifetime value is positive and it will be negative when lifetime value is negative. We can take these two dimensions and we can plot them on a two-dimensional graph. Now let's take some of our metrics and estimate where they might fit on this two-dimensional plot. Lifetime value is way over to the right. It has high correlation, basically perfect correlation, but it has really low sensitivity. It's really hard to influence and it takes an entire lifetime to influence. And then we've got a bunch of other metrics that have varying degrees of sensitivity and correlation. We might have something like a mobile app install, which has moderate sensitivity and moderate correlation. That means we have some decent degree that we can influence it. It's not super easy to influence. And we see results over some medium period of time. Not immediately, but it doesn't take forever. Then we might have saving a job. That's easier to influence and we see the results faster, but there's less correlation to the lifetime value we're trying to drive. We might have something like daily active users, which might have low correlation and low sensitivity relative to both those other metrics. Then we've got something like mouse pointer movement. That's super easy to influence. You just put a dancing monkey on the page and tell people to punch it. But there's really very little correlation between how much somebody moves a mouse and the lifetime value we're delivering to them. And then there are things like phase of the moon. We have, as far as I know, with current technology, no ability to influence the phase of the moon. And also, there's almost no correlation between phase of the moon and the lifetime value we're trying to drive. Then there are a few things that maybe look a little bit more interesting. We've got the search. That's got really high sensitivity. We can influence searches readily, and we can see the effect of that influence fairly quickly. Lower sensitivity, meaning a little harder to influence, taking a little longer to influence, is the tap. But that's got better correlation. Somebody who taps is more likely to be benefiting over their lifetime. The apply is less sensitive, but further correlation, it's better aligned with lifetime value. And it gets better with the interview, even closer to lifetime value, but we're losing sensitivity. 
because it's harder to influence whether somebody gets an interview and it takes longer to see the results. Even better than that is the offer and then the hire. The hire is something we care about quite a lot, but is super hard to influence and it takes a long time. But if somebody gets hired, we can be really confident that we're driving an increase in lifetime value for them. I wanna take a digression into something known as Pareto efficiency. This is Vilfredo Pareto, uh, who was wearing hipster beards before they were cool. He was a sociologist and economist from about 100 years ago, inventor of the 80-20 principle, as, long, as well as a number of really interesting concepts. Pareto efficiency, paraphrased here, is when you can't improve one thing without making something else worse. It's a classic trade-off situation. This is well known in the investment world in the trade-off between reward and risk. If you want to have higher reward, you have to accept a higher risk. If you want to reduce your risk, you have to accept a lower reward. We would love to be in the case of having high reward with low risk, but that's outside the Pareto frontier. That's beyond what's possible. It's impossible. Now, it is possible to have something that is both high risk and low reward. I think that's called Bitcoin. <clears throat> you can also use this in other areas, like food. There's food that's healthy, and there's food that's delicious. In general, if you want healthy food, you have to give up deliciousness. And if you want delicious food, you have to give up healthiness. We would all love to have food that's both healthy and delicious. That's not really an option in today's world. You can have food that's both unhealthy and not delicious. That's called English food. <laughs> Just a reminder, I did this in London last week. <laughs> it's okay, everybody was from somewhere else. <laughs> Let's take Pareto and m introduce him to sensitivity and correlation. Let's take the metrics we looked at before and we can actually draw a frontier through those metrics that represented the best trade-off between sensitivity and correlation. There is no metric outside of this line that has both better sensitivity and better correlation. If you want better sensitivity, you have to give up correlation. If you want better correlation, you have to give up sensitivity. Now, there are metrics that are inferior in both dimensions, but there's nothing outside that efficient frontier. These are, this is where unicorns live imaginary creatures. We would love to have something that has both sensitivity and correlation to the maximum degree, but that's not really possible. We live in a world of trade-offs. Once we've mapped this efficient frontier, we can collapse it into a single dimension that captures this trade-off more clearly. On the left side, we have highest sensitivity, where we have things like searching for jobs and tapping into a jobs. As we move along the continuum to the right, we inevitably give up sensitivity, very clearly described in this continuum. We increase correlation, we get closer and closer to the lifetime value, but we give up sensitivity. If we want to gain sensitivity, we give up correlation. On the left, we have decisions that are faster, but they're worse decisions. They're lower quality because they're less aligned with the lifetime value we're trying to drive. On the right, we're making better decisions. They're better aligned with lifetime value, but they're slower, they're harder, they take longer to see. All right, so that's really dry and really abstract. I think it's time for some funnel. That joke is hilarious. You people are a disappointment. <laughs> Let's take the flow that we had before. Starts with a search, goes to tap, goes to apply, interview, offer, and higher. We can map that to a standard product funnel. Funnels aren't just for sales, we can use them for product. So you start with somebody who says, I need a job. They search on Indeed. Some number of people who search on Indeed drop off. Some of them continue because they found something that's interesting to them. They tap into a job. Some of those continue, some of those drop off, representing the narrowing of the funnel. They apply, some drop off, some continue, through to interview, through to offer, and then to the outcome we're trying to achieve with this funnel, the higher. Throughout the process, people drop off, we get closer and closer to the end, and then we solve the problem for some proportion of our users. We can do this more generically. You start with a problem, you do some amount of work. That work produces an output. That output becomes an input to another stage of work. 
you do work there. That produces an output, which becomes an input, which feeds into another stage of work. And then through another series of work stages, all the way until the outcome or the solution to your problem, what you're trying to do in your funnel. The input in a physical process might be something like a metallic ore. The work that you do might be smelting that ore to purify and extract the metal content. The output could be bars of metal. Nobody really wants to buy bars of metal. It's just an intermediate output in the overall process. The overall process you might be trying to drive is building a car. That's the outcome that somebody wants so they can drive to work, drive home, et cetera. That's my car. I got a great deal. Hyundai Elantra value edition. I highly recommend it. So you've got this funnel, and the question is where to validate changes. You've got this multi-stage flow, and let's say you want to modify this, the second stage in the funnel. And you want, to, you want to figure out whether this modification was a good modification. Do you measure this, the immediate output, to test whether this modification was good or bad? Do you go one level further along and measure the second order output, the one after the following stage? Or this, three stages down. Or maybe you measure the final outcome. What about that? That's what you're ultimately trying to drive. Which of these things do you measure? Well, you take this generic funnel, the sequence of steps to solve a problem, and you apply the two concepts we talked about earlier. You have sensitivity. You're going to have higher sensitivity near the top of your funnel. It's easier to influence change, and it's more rapid to see the results of those change. Towards the end of the funnel is less sensitivity. It's harder to influence there, and it's slower to see the results but you get higher correlation with lifetime value. At the top of your funnel, you have low correlation. There's a lot of error and noise in the results you get from the top of your funnel. As you move further into the funnel, your correlation with lifetime value increases to the maximum you get at the end of your funnel. And this is the same trade-off as before, mapped to a product funnel. So when do you favor outputs? You should favor outputs when you're doing an exploratory product or proof of concept. When you just wanna see what's possible, get something going and get moving. You might also favor outputs when you have lots of opportunity for big improvements. When you have low correlation, there's a risk of error uh, harming your results. But if you have lots of opportunity for big improvements, the error is unlikely to harm your net gains. You might favor outputs when only simple analysis is possible maybe due to sparsity of data, maybe due to lack of sophistication of analytics tools. You might favor outputs when the owner has less influence over the outcome. The person driving the particular change, maybe they can't influence the whole funnel, maybe they can just influence one particular stage. And so you wanna keep them focused on what's within their control. You also favor outputs when there's a long feedback loop, when it takes a lot of time to learn whether you've done the right thing, how to improve it. And then, of course, a number of other reasons. Ultimately though, you favor outputs if you must. Outputs are going to be inherently error prone. They're not what you're trying to drive. You're trying to drive outcomes. And if you favor outputs unnecessarily, you might end up with t-shirts that say something like this. I help people look at job descriptions. Now of course, that's not what Indeed is here for, right? We're help, here to help people get jobs. And looking at job descriptions is just one intermediate output along that path. So when do you favor outcomes? You favor outcomes when you are late in the funnel because you're relatively close to the outcome anyway. You favor outcomes when you have smaller opportunities. When you have smaller opportunities, you wanna make the most of them. The error introduced by low correlation could be directionally wrong when you're trying to squeak out a 1% or 2% gain. You favor outcomes when you have time for sophisticated analysis, when you can apply powerful tools to tease out the cause and effect and understand what's really going well and what's not working. You favor outcomes when the owner has more influence over the outcome, maybe somebody who owns the entire funnel and has responsibility for the entire flow. You favor outcomes when there's a short feedback loop, when you can learn rapidly and evolve your product quickly, improve the features based on results you get. Ultimately though, you wanna favor outcomes if you can. Outcomes are why you're here. Outcomes are fundamentally better. So if you can at all favor outcomes, that's what you wanna do. That's when to measure in your funnel. What about what to measure in your funnel? You should look at timeless needs. Now, 
you're working on a product and your solutions are always evolving. You're adding new features, you're tweaking them, you're improving your product. But your user's needs and your preferences are not. So when you go working on your product, you don't want an invalid hypothesis, which is some action that you uh, take to change your product and some arbitrary metric that you've chosen just for that particular change. A valid hypothesis is something where you have an action that leads to a B, that leads to a C, that eventually leads to some kind of persistent need that drives lifetime value. That's a more valid hypothesis for improving your product. I'm gonna put, uh, use the words of somebody a lot smarter and a lot more successful than me, Mr. Jeff Bezos. He said, I very frequently get the question, what's going to change in the next 10 years? I almost never get the question, what's not going to change in the next 10 years? That second question is actually the more important of the two because you can build a business strategy around the things that are stable in time. We know that customers want low prices and I know that's going to be true 10 years from now. They want fast delivery, they want vast selection. It's impossible to imagine a future 10 years from now where a customer comes up and says, Jeff, I love Amazon, I just wish the prices were a little higher. Or, I love Amazon, I just wish you'd deliver a little more slowly. You may not be Amazon, but your users have timeless needs that are gonna be stable over time. And you want your metrics to focus on those timeless needs. You also want metrics that have many degrees of freedom. You wanna choose metrics that can be improved multiple ways. Now, I have lots of ideas that I think are great, but a lot of painful experience has taught me that my first effort will fail. And if you're anything like me, your first effort will fail too. That doesn't reflect poorly on you. I'm sure you're knowledgeable, capable, motivated, but ideas, there are a lot of bad ones out there and we don't necessarily recognize them until we try them. So you have to expect that your first effort will fail. You will need backup plans. Plans B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to Z maybe. Your metric needs to be able to work with plan B and plan C and plan D. It should measure your effectiveness solving the problem, not your effectiveness implementing a particular solution. You also wanna favor specific over generic. Who here would like a delicious glass of champagne in an elegant crystal flute? Anyone? Does that sound good? Few people. All right. Who would like a receptacle of fermented beverage? Receptacle of fermented beverage? That's weird. I just saw hands for the flute of champagne. But a flute of champagne is actually a receptacle of a fermented beverage. But yeah, those specifics matter, right? And it's similar, like one is approximately the same as the other, but there's a whole lot that's lost going from a flute of delicious champagne to some receptacle of some kind of fermented beverage. You wanna make sure you don't do the same thing with generic metrics. Things like engagement, time on site, and likes. These are generic, but they're maybe as delicious as receptacle of fermented beverage, as opposed to flute of champagne. Now, don't get me wrong, these things are necessary, but necessary is not the same as sufficient. These more generic criteria are going to be easier to satisfy. It's easier to get some kind of engagement on the page than the engagement that drives a successful outcome. More generic is going to be less correlated. Any click on a page. Let's take the search page. We've got three different things here that people can tap on. We've got a job link that leads to more information about the job. We've got a job save, and we've got reviews. Is all engagement equal here? Or is some of this engagement more valuable to solving problems than others? If it was all the same, my t-shirt would say, I help people tap links, not I help people get jobs. We have an opinion here. We care about which links matter, so we shouldn't have metrics that treat them all as though they're equivalent. When you do that, you're asking vague questions. When you ask vague questions, you get useless answers. And when you get useless answers, you drive unproductive actions. More specific metrics are going to be more correlated. They're gonna be better aligned with the value you're trying to drive. When you have more specific metrics, you're asking specific questions. When you ask specific questions, you get specific answers, and these specific actions, answers will drive specific actions that enhance your product and solve your users' problems. Every interesting phenomenon is multidimensional. So take this handsome fellow here on the streets of Amsterdam back in March. He's about five foot ten and a half inches in height, and that half is really important. 
He's about 175 pounds, and because he's eating a delicious Stroopwafel, that's going up. The temperature is 31 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't recommend going to Amsterdam in March. Just a little tip for you. Location, Amsterdam, and uh, proceeding north through, northwest through the streets. Hunger, 2.6, and going down. As I mentioned, delicious Stroopwafel. But uh, Stroopwafels, almost down to three quarters and declining. That's a really negative trend. But more seriously, to describe everything that's happening in this picture, you need multiple dimensions. You need to understand the person, you need to understand where it is, you need to understand what's happening. And your product is similar. So let's look at your multi-dimensional funnel. Let's take this funnel and isolate one stage in that funnel. There are certain ways of measuring funnel stages that are portable across all products. One is the quantity of the input. How much are you putting into this funnel stage? Then there's also the quality of the input. How good is what's going into this funnel stage? You also want to measure the quantity of the output, how much is coming out of the stage, and also the quality of the output. Another measure is the time that it takes to do the work in the stage, the time from input to output. You also want to measure the user effort. How much work do you put in to making this happen? And then there's the pleasantness or the enjoyment of this experience. I don't know what product funnel that guy is in, but it seems amazing. You've got a bunch of general funnel stage measures then, and you can apply this to pretty much any stage of any product funnel. This gives you a good idea of what you can measure at the funnel stage. These, sorry, at the funnel stage. These also apply to your funnel as a whole for the most part. Quality of input, quantity of input, time to complete, effort to complete, and then enjoyment. To that, we also add the number of steps. How many stages of work are there in your funnel from the problem to the solution or the outcome you're trying to drive? There's also the quality of the outcome. I like my Hyundai Elantra, but man, it would be awesome to get an Acura NSX. And then there's the quantity of outcome as well. How much outcome are you driving for how many people? And then you've got these standard metrics that you can apply to pretty much every funnel. You take these nine funnel metrics and these eight funnel stage metrics, and you've got so many choices, right? You've got to choose between them. There's this phrase that's used a lot in product management, in technology in particular, and it's the North Star. So how do you go about finding your North Star when there's so many different choices, so many different metrics you could apply to your funnel? Your North Star is the concept around which everything else orbits. Everything else circles around this North Star, and it gives you true direction for how to take your product. Did anybody uh, read this book, see this movie, The Fault in Our Stars? Well, there's also a fault in our North Stars. Let's take the real North Star. This is the map above geographic north of the Earth. This is Polaris, the North Star. Or I should say, it's the current North Star. There's a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes, where there's a 26,000 year cycle where the North changes and we have a different North Star. So right now, Polaris is the North Star. But a few thousand years from now, it's gonna be Gamma Cephei. A few thousand years after that, it's gonna be Alderaman. And a few thousand years after that, it's going to be Deneb. This idea that we use of the North Star as being the one true direction, even the real North Star is flawed because every metric deviates, even your North Star. How can you go about getting back on course? Well, every metric deviates, but different metrics deviate in different ways. They don't all have the same amount of error and they don't all have the same direction of error. Let's take a different example. Let's take red, okay? Let's say red is our measure, red is our dimension that we're using. Well, we get some information out of this, right? But it's a poor representation of reality. How about green? Green gives us a different form of error. There is still a sizable error, but it's a different type of error. And then there's blue. Blue has error as well. If we looked at any single one of these, we would be getting a deeply flawed picture. But even though each one of these has error, they have different error. They have errors in different directions. We can combine them, and if we combine them, we get a rich, full color picture of reality. That's the, that's the same thing with metrics. If you combine multiple metrics, you can cancel out a whole lot of error, as long as they err in different directions. That brings us to the question of how many metrics. 
Well, if you've got too many metrics, it's going to restrict your movement. I talked about Pareto and the Pareto efficiency before. It's hard to improve one thing without degrading other things when you have a lot of things in play. If you've got 20 different metrics and you're trying to improve one of them, there's a good chance you're gonna degrade one of the other 19. Let's say you've got one metric. With any given change, you've got a 50% chance of that one metric improving. If you've got two metrics, all else being equal, there's a 25% chance of a change improving both metrics. Bring it up to three, it goes down to a 12.5% chance. Bring it down to four, it's just a six and a quarter chance, percent chance that any given change will improve all of your metrics. The more metrics you have, the harder and harder it is to make a positive change. We can take the degrees of freedom and plot them against the number of metrics. You have a whole lot of freedom with just one metric, but as you add metrics, it degrades further and further and further until when you have a ton of metrics, you have very low freedom. Then I'd also like to introduce the concept of marginal information gain. Every metric you add should significantly improve the quality of your decisions. As you increase number of metrics, the amount of information you have increases. The second metric increases, the third metric increases, but you get diminishing returns because you probably picked the highest value metric first, then the second highest metric, then the third highest metric. You get diminishing returns, so each added metric gives you less and less marginal information gain. If you combine the two, you end up with a trade-off. You have to balance the increase of information from more metrics with the loss of freedom that those same metrics inflict on you. And you have to find a good balance point. My recommendation as a one size fits most is to target three to four independent metrics to optimize for. Of course, you pay attention to many more things and you monitor many more things, but when you're targeting and when you're optimizing, three to four is a one size fits most for the right balance between information and freedom. Now metrics aren't just looking backward. You can also have better prediction using mental models built around your metrics. To do this, you have to forget what the metric means. We have a lot of aesthetic preferences. We have a lot of in opinions about what makes a good metric, but I, I tell you to forget all of that and instead focus on what optimizing the metric does. Metrics are models. They're a framework for teaching us how to think. And metrics are not reality. Metrics are not anything beyond that. The measure of a model is its utility. It's not its truth, its accuracy, or meaning. It's how well it helps you guide decisions. And also, you shouldn't look to models to explain. Models do not explain. They just describe and predict. You can do this using thought experiments, just like real science. The most famous thought experiment is, of course, that of Schrodinger's cat in quantum mechanics. In a product thought experiment, you ask, what actions improve my metric? You also ask, what actions degrade my metric? Let's take a concrete example from Indeed's funnel. Let's say we're looking at the metric of the phone screen, and we're trying to consider whether we should target phone screens and optimize phone screens. If we're optimizing phone screens, then we might encourage broader distribution of applications across jobs, because we get more phone screens when more people are seeing more jobs. We might also be motivated to do more selective targeting of jobs. It doesn't matter if I put a ton of jobs in front of you if they're not relevant. I need to put jobs in front of you that you're likely to apply to and proceed to the phone screen stage. I also want deeper engagement. I wanna favor users who have a motivation to engage more deeply, and I wanna encourage users to engage more deeply. Shallow engagement won't get you to the phone screen. And on the discouraging side, I'm discouraging many applications to fewer jobs. The first person applying to a job has some chance of getting a phone interview, but the 100th person, the 1,000th person, as we pile more and more applications onto the same job, we reduce the chance of that person actually getting a phone screen because the employer is inundated. It also discourages indiscriminate targeting of jobs. If I put a job in front of you that's not relevant, you're not going to apply, the employer is not going to favor you, there's going to be no phone screen. It also discourages insincere activity where you apply for the job, but then when the employer responds to you like, eh, you know, it's not worth it. I'm, I'm not gonna rearrange my schedule to do the phone screen, et cetera. We look at these various things that optimizing encourages and discourages, and we have to ask, is this what we want? 
This isn't about right or wrong. It's about alignment with goals and strategies. This thought experiment is a tool to help you think and see whether optimizing a metric matches your strategy. Sometimes you go through this process and you end up with two similar options and you have to choose between these similar options. Let's take one example of phone screens, two ways to interpret it. Volume would be the total number of phone screens that you have occurring as a result of your product. Coverage will be the number of job seekers who experience a phone screen. If we put these two against each other in a particular scenario, let's say we have the scenario with five job seekers. One job seeker experiences five phone screens. According to our volume metric, therefore, that's five. But according to our coverage metric, that's only one because all of this benefit is going to a single job seeker. A similar scenario, we have one job seeker with one phone screen, a second job seeker with three phone screens, and a third job seeker with one phone screen. According to volume, it's the same as before. We have five total phone screens happening. But according to coverage, we're up to three because there are three job seekers who are experiencing a phone screen. Third scenario, we have four job seekers, each of whom is experiencing a phone screen. According to our volume metric, this is actually worse. We have a four instead of a five in the previous scenarios. But according to our coverage metric, this is actually better. We went from three to four. So we have improved coverage steadily, but we have lost volume. This helps us figure out where do they diverge. We're trying to choose between these two metrics and an exercise, a thought experiment like this, helps us identify where they disagree and where they diverge. Now, there's no right answer. We have to ask the question of ourselves, do we wanna be good for more job seekers or do we wanna be even better for fewer job seekers? This is a choice about values, about strategy, about outcomes. It's not about the best answer in an objective vacuum. And that brings me to the idea that metrics equal strategy. Your choice of metrics defines your problem. When the metrics are poor, that means the problem exists in volume and in significance. As you improve, as you solve the problem better and better and better, your metrics improve, reflecting the increasing effectiveness of your solution. And if you don't measure it at all, then it doesn't matter to you. It's not part of the problem you're trying to solve. It's not part of the solution you're trying to drive. And you're going to get what you measure. Every story of metrics misuse is a story of badly chosen metrics. People chose metrics and they got what they measured, but it turns out what they were measuring was not what they wanted. We're no better, we've made this mistake. We've increased job clicks by blasting more emails. We had an A-B test that we ran last year where we kept reminding job seekers over and over, hey, recruiter contacted you, we're waiting for your response. We were measuring job clicks, but we weren't measuring the outcomes, we weren't measuring user annoyance. This was a bad choice of metrics. Because we had a bad choice of metrics, we had the wrong problem or the wrong understanding of the problem. And because we had the wrong problem, we had an ineffective solution. We didn't end up driving any significant number of hires because we drove noise, we drove annoyance. Awesome data can't fix that. It doesn't matter how many terabytes and petabytes of data we have. No matter how good the data it is, we're not going to fix that problem. You'll never find your strategy in the data. You have to bring your own strategy. You have to bring your own values. You have to bring your own outcomes and your own goals. And then you wanna be doing science to it. This hopefully gives you the tools that you can use to convert that strategy and convert those tools into useful outcomes. Here are six things to try in your next product meeting. Number one, estimate sensitivity and correlation for the metrics in your product. You can do this in a super rigorous, super scientific way, but you can also get a lot of mileage just by estimating roughly how much sensitivity and how much correlation you have. Then you wanna find your Pareto frontier. You wanna find the metrics that represent the best possible trade-off between sensitivity and correlation. Metrics where you cannot improve sensitivity without degrading correlation, and metrics where you can't improve correlation without degrading sensitivity. Then you wanna map your funnel and apply the standard metrics, the generic metrics that are portable to any flow, to any product. You wanna trade off between outputs and outcomes, optimizing for the right one in the right situation. Think about targeting three to four independent metrics. 
This is not the one size that fits all, but it's a decent one size fits most that trades off between freedom of action and quality of information. Then finally, run thought experiments. Ask, what might happen if we try to maximize this metric? What actions does it motivate? What actions does it demotivate? And that brings us to the end, for real this time. Thank you. <laughs>